Welcome back to Monroe Live. Today we have a Jeep Grand Cherokee, 4xe edition. So this is not an electric vehicle, it is a hybrid vehicle. And I'm trying to remember, I do believe that since I have worked with Monroe a little over a year now, this is the first Chrysler FCA Stellantis vehicle that we have been able to review. So let's see what we can find. The traditional look of a Jeep Grand Cherokee, it's a high volume seller, it's very, very popular. Um, so everyone has seen that, but let's look at some of the new design for the interior. Now in a lot of vehicles that we've looked at, we've talked about how they want very linear lines going side to side in vehicle. This only halfway goes there. You see that very linear top pad, almost a straight line sewn seam. But when you look between on either side of that center screen, you'll notice that there are a lot of layers and that they don't necessarily follow a straight line. They kind of walk. There are a lot of curves. We're going to get into a lot of those layers in a minute, but I still want to have this thousand foot view. I like reviewing a vehicle that has a white or cream interior because all of the different features stand out more. Now, not only do the features stand out more, but the errors stand out as well. We're going to get into some of that as well. Look at our doors. We have a wood grain upper. We have a decorative light pipe, a wrapped medallion, wrapped armrest, injection molded plastic below. There is actually a light inside of this small cup holder for ease of seeing and access. And then look at that speaker cover, a mix between chrome and piano black. I'm not a Post to it, it's kind of interesting, um, but it's not some of the more hidden design features that a lot of people are trying to see. That one is enhanced. Now, when they get to the injection molded components, all right, so this lower, that's just plastic injection mold. They'll change this color to match the seating, to match the interior. But look at the switches, three black switches. Now that is a decision for a cost save. They have a lot going on there. They're trying to print those labels on those components and you really could not have that white with white printing. So those have been left black, but it kind of has three distinct islands in the middle of this part that are all black. Uh, I don't think it blends enough, um, but if I were trying to consult with them, I honestly would not tell them to make those components a mold in color to match the rest of the interior just because of the headache of trying to work around the printing. There is something, however, that I really like on the seat side shield. The entire switch bank is an A side lobe. So why is that important? A lot of the side shields that we saw, the switch would load from the B side and then all of these buttons would pop on through little tiny holes in the side shield. What this does is this allows them to change up the style a lot. These buttons and the switch itself may be common from vehicle to vehicle. So their whole placement has to be common, but this decorative trim gets to change. So they can get a lot more design flexibility with a system like this, still keeping the same switch itself, but have all of the garnish trim around it be different. So I like that type of an execution. I hate lines that are intentionally designed to match up, especially when a door interfaces with an instrument panel. If you ever have those seams or those lines trying to come together, it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be some sort of a difference. The IP has its mounting positions. And if in just the bolts cause that to tip in a different direction, the door panel is being mounted to this steel of the frame. If there's any variance in the door panel mounting, the steel of the outer door is now being bolted with the hinges. And if there's any variance there, all of that variation is seen at this seam. Now they've broken it up by putting on this chrome accent going from top to bottom. We have a lot of different layers here on the IP. None of those layers transition to the door, but there's a lot of the same look between the layers. They have purposely made a design decision that saves them a lot of headache on fit and finish 
Um, but it looks correct and it looks complete. I really, really respect that because every time I had a vehicle where I'm in charge of the instrument panel, they would put on the drawing, they would put on the print that the instrument panel must line up to the door within such and such a dimension. And I would complain, like, I am making the instrument panel. I am not installing the instrument panel into the vehicle. I am not making the door. I am not installing the door to the vehicle. So why are you trying to make me hold some sort of a tolerance to something that I can never measure because this is being put together in the OEM plant. It is not being assembled in my plant. So I am very, very grateful since I actually was part of the team that designed this IP that this decision is in place to help solve that issue. But let's look at these layers in the IP. We have a wrapped top pad. Now that is definitely a wrapped top pad. Look at all the seams. Seam breakups across the top the decorative seam on the front, that is not a big sheet of material that has been thermoformed to wrap to a part. We've seen that on a few of our IPs where they'll have one big thermoform sheet and then they'll stitch that thermoform sheet across the front. This one is actually matched to the surface with flat material that is cut and sewn to match the profile, breaks where it needs to happen. Now I can give you a little background on this is this is a semi-automated process that does this instrument panel. Some of it has to be done by hand, but a lot of the finishing work is actually done by machine, which allows them a narrow cycle time. It's very impressive to be able to do this on such a large part, um, saving a lot of time and a lot of cost. But in getting through the rest of the layers, look at our air vents. These are not hidden air vents. We have a large center air vent and then an air vent on either side. The air vents themselves, we have a flat matte black finish going to a chrome edge. Okay, so now we have a chrome border. Let's blow our chrome border. Piano black. Let's be able to blow our piano black. We have a wrapped piece of trim. Below our wrapped trim, we have wood. Below the wood, we have another metal edge. And then going into the IP lower. Now I can tell you that this is not the upper trim level version. There is a higher trim level where these components are actually wrapped materials as well, continuing all the way down. That is a lot of stacked layers, and that is a lot of fights between a lot of individual people. And I can give you a little background on that. This screen, not all vehicles come with this screen. So there is another option where this is a single wrapped panel without that video screen. We actually sat in a room with roughly 30 people for hours fighting over land. The people that designed the air vents and the mechanism that's behind these wheels saying we need a fixed dimension for all of that mechanism to work. People that were designing the chrome said, well, for this to attach, we need this fixed dimension. The people who designed the screen said, well, the, the electronics for the screen need this width, so we have to pack uh, account for this type of area. I was managing these components saying, well, I have minimum on B side for attachments. I need to protect for this area. And it was a fight between all 30 of us from a bunch of different companies, literally fighting over millimeters and fractions of millimeters. There is not one central group that makes all these decisions. Um, there are literally hundreds of people who have to design and think about every fraction of a millimeter of every single component in a vehicle. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, to bring a vehicle to market, especially a new vehicle, can be a billion dollar investment because everything must be designed. And eventually I think I'm going to do a video about injection molding to show you that it's not just cheap plastic. There's a lot that needs to be considered. All right, so. I also have a wrapped airbag. We had a wrapped airbag on the Tesla Model S. Most of the time, those are just injection mold. So an airbag has to deploy through this wrapped component. So the plastic component is weakened for the airbag and this leather wrapping is weakened for the airbag. But this one seems to do a fairly good job. The lighting's not perfect, but I can see a breakaway line on this side. I can't see this side as well. I think it's just because I'm getting more light from the door. 
that's a fairly well hidden airbag. Using the controls, all right, for a lot of us, we're trying to get rid of a lot of controls, get rid of a lot of buttons, but this still gives us a lot of options. There are a lot of buttons here on the steering wheel, but look at the buttons on the top here, actually going into the land for the uh, air vent. They read top down. I am six foot two. I can kind of read them at an angle from my seating position, but someone who might be a little shorter, those buttons might be hard to access, hard to even realize that they're there. Going down forward, we have all of the climate control buttons. Now this has the opposite issue. These buttons are kind of turned at an undercut. So viewing from above, I'm just skipping those. And it's the viewing is not so much of a problem, it is the use. If I wanted to come straight onto this button or this knob, I have to come in kind of low and below. I'm not naturally grabbing it from above. So it's a little uncomfortable to use. All right, we have a lot of piano black and we have a lot of chrome accents. We have a sliding bin. Oh, nope. All right. USB ports, charge port, 12 volt, HDMI, wonderful. The Prindle. Here's your shifter. I used to complain about all of the Chrysler shifters because they were different between every vehicle. Sometimes they were knobs. Sometimes they were a knob on the IP. Sometimes it was a paddle on the IP or a paddle on the center console. They had no consistency between their brand and that used to really, really bug me. This is not so bad. We can see it light up when the vehicle is on. Cover for our cup holder. Center console armrest. Now, another one where we have a shallow upper bin and then the lower bin. I don't like the upper bin. Now, this is kind of small. Normally, I would like a sliding lid with that upper bin, just covering half of it. Because accidentally dropping that or making a mess of all the stuff that is traveling with the center console lid, I really don't like that idea. So a lot of these components are made by different people. And I wanna talk about some consistency from the vehicle. This IP, we have a French seam. This French seam, if we measure it from decorative stitch to decorative stitch is six millimeters. We have the seam on the door as well. Measuring that one, I have six millimeters. We have a single sided decorative stitch here. Single-sided decorative stitch measuring from the center out. I have three. So this is truly this French stitch with one side missing. Here's the center armrest, which is done by a completely different company. If I measured this one from decorative stitch to decorative stitch, I come up with five. So it's different from the IP and then the doors. Now I have a single-sided stitch on the seats. We have a single-sided stitch on the IP, which we measured at roughly three. If I measure this one, well, that's also five. So this single-sided stitch is actually measuring the same width as this French seam, which is not the same width as this French seam on the IP. So they have some inconsistencies there. Now, as I said, I like white interiors because it makes it easy for me to review a vehicle, but it also makes it easier for me to show off flaws. Look at the wrinkles on this bolster. This is a fairly new vehicle, but those are really, really popping out. A lot of this has real leather, so there's the possibility of that cracking apart over time. So here's the question. Is it the design that's causing ingress, egress, people crushing this bolster? causing these wrinkles? Or is it the quality of the material that they're using causing those wrinkles? Now, regardless of the quality of material, what I can pick out is the quality of this stitching. I would say that this is fairly low quality stitching that is being enhanced by the color. There's a lot of stretching. 
If you look at these joint seams, you can see that the material almost looks like it's tearing itself because it's underneath so much pressure. And because of the contrasting color of this, I'm not sure, brown burgundy thread, you can see a lot of inconsistency in the stitching of that decorative thread as well. So this vehicle has a lot of high-end features. And in my opinion, Chrysler in general, FCA or Stellantis, gives you a lot more higher end features than what you were paying for. When we compare that to the Rivian, the Rivian had a lot of high end materials and features, but they made a lot of decisions in their construction that cost them more money. And I feel that they probably pay more money for their vehicle than they sell it for. This vehicle here, they've made a lot of those decisions, but I can see from some of these inconsistencies, they're probably not paying as much money as Rivian would be paying for the same thing. But it, you can still check off a lot of boxes saying, yes, I have this. Yes, I have wrapped. It's hand cut and sew. It's leather. It is wood grain. They've checked all those boxes, but whether they executed it as well as they could have, that's another story. The rear seat is not uncomfortable. It's quite nice. You have a center console that has our own climate control another 110 and USB controls as well. This is a feature I have always hated. The mesh map pocket with these little grocery hooks. I think that it looks cheap. I don't like this execution at all. But it's something that has honestly been around for probably 20 years. In my past life, I was working on a program they wanted the grocery hooks. This is supposedly so you can hang a bag from here. But someone had said that someone in the past had complained that a hook had caught on their clothing while they were getting in or out of the vehicle and it tore their clothing. So they wanted us to design a hook that would not catch on clothing. So I said, wait a minute, you want to design a hook that doesn't hook? It didn't really make sense to me. Um, they went down that road for a while trying to talk about what different shapes would be more beneficial. And then eventually the whole thing just went away. Nobody cared anymore. This seat has a hard back panel. But I can also tell you that since this is not the high-end version, there is also a wrapped version of this back panel. So we have a two-piece hard back panel, not just one. So you have the option of changing this out with different materials over time if you want to have a different look. So... My second row seat, what are the features that I have? I have a fold down armrest. Now I think it's kind of impressive that this is a very narrow armrest, but they still had this style of cup holder. A lot of OEMs will say, well, if I have a narrow second row armrest, I have to have a deployable cup holder because I don't have the thickness that I need for that armrest or that cup holder. The deployable cup holders always feel cheap in my mind. It does not matter how high end of a vehicle it is. They always feel loose, rattly. So a fixed cup holder, I appreciate more. Now there's another hidden feature. That is the lower hooks if you have child safety seats. There's a flap that covers them up. Now this is for you to determine whether this flap is a good idea. For me, I am never using these. I do not need access to them. This flap is going to be in place all of the time and no one's even gonna know it's there. Okay, but let's say you're a person who uses that child safety seat often. I worry that this flap, which is always going to be down, going back and forth, is gonna get worn out and start looking bad over time. Now, it does have little Velcro tabs so that it will at least hold itself back but, I mean, if that flaps up, your kids are getting in here, beating it up, dogs getting in here, ripping it over. Hopefully you're not putting your dog in your $75,000 car and letting them run crazy. But that's just a thought and a fear for me. More vehicles are building in a screen into the rear door. We've had a couple of them that we've reviewed, but not a lot. Um, I've had one vehicle that I worked on where they wanted this to be a power feature that would actually move up and down on its own. 
I'm always afraid of any mechanism like that. Those are the things that break and then really annoy you. This, I might cut the mesh, but more than likely I'm not breaking the mechanism. So having this as a built-in comfort feature for your rear occupants, I do like that. Now having to work around this is always a pain. This is a wrapped component here, but it's a hard injection mold behind. I worked on one where they wanted the whole thing to be one piece wrapped and then this to just come through the inner. You can't do that, think about it. If I laid a sheet of paper over here, I'm slitting the sheet of paper. I don't have excess material to go and wrap inside. Um, and then you also can't fit your hand in there to try and wrap inside. So they do need to be two pieces, which is what they did here. So we have a large flat area. We can fold down these seats and see what that would look like. So that would continue on. That's nice. Well, what about loose part storage? Okay, there is a load floor underneath this mat. I don't know if this mat is an option if it only comes with the upper trim levels, but underneath that load floor, pretty much all the space is taken. I have a small little cavity here, but do I have a convenient place to put a snow scraper? Now, not everywhere across the country has to worry about a snow scraper or a br uh, snow brush, but we do. As a matter of fact, I had to take one out of this vehicle for filming today. So yes, a full size spare is nice to have, but it's eating up a lot of space that could be protected covered storage. Inside of the rear compartment, D-rings. So we've talked about that in a few vehicles. We do have four fixed D-rings. Those actually feel like real metal too. They might be sintered, but a really good feeling using those D-rings rather than just having an injection molded plastic. So four of them, I have four corners. So if I'm putting something heavy here, I can strap it back that way, or I could possibly strap it to the rear, although you would never really strap them to the rear. The only benefit that I see to these D-rings is if I'm trying to actually tie down the tailgate. So if I have something oversized and I want to hold this down, but what they never do is provide you a location on the tailgate to do that. I mean, I might be able to hook into here, but that's one criticism that I have. I think trunks and tailgates should have a hook to be able to pull them down. This is an SUV. What if I want to get lumber? If I have a four by eight sheet of plywood here, it's going to stop right there. It needs to be able to be secured in that position in my mind. Maybe for liability reasons, they don't want to provide someone that option. So look at the skid plate here. Continuous skid plate, we have a latch, but how does the latch engage here? Well, this moves. That's neat, but if it moves that easy, how does it work as a skid plate? If I actually have something in here that's hitting this, needing to actually work off of a skid plate, actually oppose force, this is opposing no force. So, is it there simply for the look? It looks continuous when this is open. Is it providing some sort of protective function? My fear is if anything falls in there, this is going to prevent it from going all the way down. And if anything falls in there, I can't get it out. Oh, and look, there's a little chunk of something off of that side. So eventually this might be built up with dirt, gravel, how do I really get in there to clean it out? Hit it with a blower off to the sides, try and vacuum it out. I don't know if this feature provides an actual benefit or if it's just for aesthetics. So we have a full sky view um, overhead. The front open, the front will open tilt to provide ventilation, but a lot of people now are liking this full view. For me, 
I don't want that sun beating down on my head. I like having it, but yeah, I very, very rarely use my sunroof in my vehicle. Now, some people also complain or question, what about the safety? If this thing rolls over and I have this big piece of glass over my head, we know from IIHS, from the video that we did with them, that when they test roof crush, they're actually seeing on average better performance from the sunroof vehicles than they do see with the solid roof vehicles. That's because the automakers know that they have to support what they're putting up here. So sometimes they actually put more consideration into making this stronger than a normal solid roof would be. So again, this is an expensive feature. It's a feature that I like to have, but I truly rarely use just because I'm going bald and I don't want to get that sunburn. So I hope you've enjoyed this walkthrough. I think that they've did a lot of impressive things for the price point. I think that they had some errors which are easy to identify so that they can work on. So I know that there's going to be some more future videos with this vehicle and other videos within Monroe Live. So thank you for watching and if you have not subscribed, please do and have a good day.